How do you do? My name is Robbie Thigpen, and I'm here to discuss some of the research that I've been performing here for a few years and uh, part of the project that Kathy Redvar and Hilaria Poop Cahoon are working with me on. Um, unlike most of the, uh, all, all of the other panelists in our group, I was not working on sargassum prior to COVID. However, I was working on as various aspects of the blue economy carbon, climate change, and things like that. And I'm going to share that with you to begin with because we're going to be talking about mangrove ecosystem, which is a very res important part of a blue economy. Additionally, um, I did start working on sargassum at the beginning of this year and all through the sargassum podcast and some other things. And we'll be talking about that in just a moment. So let's get going. Oh, one more thing. When I say all stakeholder groups, I'm really talking about those that have been mar usually marginalized in these conversations. And that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. I've been living with the indigenous peoples off and on since 1996. My first trip out of the country was to East Africa. I uh, love, I live with the Scott and Maasai people. I love listening to them talk about the, their ecosystem and, and life ways. And it was just wonderful. I had, uh, Usually I was deeply immersed in these communities by myself. And I uh, would occasionally get out and I'd do some stuff with some NGOs or I'd go into Nairobi or something to, to clear my head a little bit. And what I saw with these NGOs, they're much well-meaning people and, and there'd always be little small bits of friction in there. They'd be speaking to these people in English or, uh, or in Swahili sometimes, which may, what might, what's their first language. It might not have been the first language of the, it certainly wasn't the first language of the cop people where we were building this bridge. And there would always be some friction that, that I saw going on, never really understood it at that point. Um, and sometimes there'd be a big problem that arose for one reason or another. And that always got blamed on the people. And I was never really comfortable with that because that wasn't happening when I was in these communities by myself. And I was never comfortable with it, but I, I didn't know what else to do except accept it as it was. 2004, I came to the uh, Caribbean to work in the uh, indigenous lobster fishery of Belize. And I was elucidating food webs uh, surrounding Panulirus argus, a Caribbean spiny lobster. We were doing that with staple isotope analysis. And to get my, collect my tissue samples, I needed to work with the fishermen as a sideband. And I got pretty popular. I knew my way around a boat in traps and fish, a lot of these fishing techniques already. And, uh, and all I wanted for pay was a little tiny little piece of tissue sample and, and to, to you know, measure and see what sex they were, which was wonderful for them. I got what I wanted, they got what they wanted. And uh, so the fishermen, they, they wanted to teach me as much as they could so that I could work better for them. And so they started teaching me their ecological knowledge. And what I began to realize was that in many ways, there are uh, uh, ecological knowledge is not just similar to mine. In some ways, they were exactly the same. I mean, they're you know, how many ways are they to catch a, a red snapper? I can count them all on one hand. And that's the same, that's true in every part of the Caribbean, as well as South Carolina, where I was raised. And and so I thought that was pretty awesome. You know, in, in terrestrial ecosystems, they got pine forests, they got foxes, turkeys, raccoons, deer, just like we do. And and so it was, it was, it was pretty cool to, to realize how much knowledge I had in the ecosystem already that I'd learned about from my father and uncles and, and whatnot, and much about by being in similar systems. And also lived with the uh, Maya family from up north, and I would live near Belize City. They didn't like me to speak English in the house. I wanted to use Creole because that's the language they had adopted. And so they taught me that. I, I don't like to talk it today. I sound simple, but I understand it good, good. And so they were really great. This also gave me access to the uh, education system a little bit because I would help the students, with the children with their homework and, and all the, you know, interacted as one of the guardians when, I, <laughs> that, when the parents were busy and needed me to go and do something at the school. And, and so that was all good. And so um, I started to see some things that weren't quite right. There's five languages that are spoken in different homes depending on who you are and where you live in Belize, but all the textbooks are in English. And I, I just saw that was an issue for learning. The little baby on the left and the little girl on, with the blue top on the right is NIE. She took her first steps walking to me. She just graduated sixth form, 
last week. And she's starting the University of Belize in, uh, in September. And I'm really, I'm so proud of her. One time a fisherman, fisherman our biologist came down and to do some research with the fishermen. And I said, yeah, I can introduce you to a couple of guys. And he's explained to them what, what they want. Now Creole is the language of the fishery. And some of the words sound like English, but they mean something different. And he's explaining to them. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I think you just said it doesn't mean what you think it means. You got to do, say it differently. He got mad at me. I said, okay, your, your project, your problem. And the project failed because Fisherman did exactly what he said, did exactly what he told them. He got mad at them because they didn't do what he said and they can't figure out why he was, they were, he was mad at them because they did exactly what he said. And I realized that's what was happening in uh, under, I, when I was in, uh, in East Africa as well. It was the exact same situation. And just light bulbs went off. Um, if that guy's listening to me today, you know who you are. I'm talking about you, buddy. I'll never let you forget. <laughs> and, um, but anyway, <laughs> I started seeing these two things, these two things about the education system and and all this stuff kind of coalesced at the same time. And I realized it had to be a better way. I said, I can fix this. Um, I reached out to Ms. Myrna Mazanara, so the Belize Creole Council, Savannah Woods and some others, and started talking to them about it. And they're like, yeah, this is interesting. This, you can do this. I think they understood better what I was trying to do than I was. The, the hardest part about the project thus far has been learning how to talk about it, learning how to describe it to other people. And what I tell you today is I've been designing methods to seamlessly combine indigenous ecological knowledge system with Western science to create a novel STEM curriculum. And um, these here are some of the things that UNESCO, they came out with a paper a couple years ago, said that this is what was needed for, 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 to, to the linguistically diverse education system of the uh, greater group or everywhere around the planet really. And, and these are some pretty serious issues. We thought they were good. And uh, we were, we've dealt with these, with many of these things already. And all, um, except for probably provision of teaching materials, we, we, but we're providing, we're, we're developing some right now. We're developing a, a biocultural STEM curriculum. And I call it biocultural because what we needed was, is what I thought we needed, because we're only working with biology in ecology. We're, we're only working with biology. And what, what I needed was that, for my indigenous sisters and brothers to be able to see their ecological knowledge in these books, in these curriculum, and to see it treated as equal to Western science. And simultaneously, it had to be indistinguishable from modern biology curriculum to biologists and educators. It's a pretty big ask, but I, I think we've accomplished that. Additionally, we wanted materials that would foster the ecological identity these people already have to help expand that ecological identity to incorporate additional knowledge, just like our Western science books do for us. Now, this is me climbing a 3,000 meter, a 300 meter, <laughs> um, 3,000 meter, yeah, 3,000 meter um, pinnacle in Rocky Mountain National Park without a rope. And this is not the most exciting thing I've ever done in my life. This is. This is our first prototype of the bioculture curriculum that I described a moment ago. It's uh, on mangrove ecosystems, blue carbon, climate change, and stuff like that. <clears throat> this is in Maya Yucateco. It says marine conservation without borders. This is Chukta Orba, the mangroves. And you see it's got its own ISBN number and it's even copyrighted material. Um, this too is in Maya. This is a Miss Felicita Cantuna. All, all our books we uh, have had ask a local knowledge keeper to write an introduction for us. And this was written by Miss Felicita Cantuna, your correct Belize. This here is in Creole, Belizean Creole, in Bale de Ta Like Alawi. And this is on mangroves, and, and we come out swinging with this. Um, everybody knows, everybody's been around mangroves at all, whether you work around them or been around them or just went to the beach or something, you know that birds live in the mangroves. This is what I call a biocultural constant. This is what makes these materials, creating these kind of materials possible, is these biocultural constants. And we come out swinging with the first one, something that everybody knows. And, um, and so that's what we got in here. 
And this is knowledge that everybody around the sea already possesses. And then we add to that, we tell them why it's important to the birds and some other things too. The Sierra language is Wayanaki, or La Guajira, Colombia, and all really wonderful people out there. And this is, uh, this, this is we're talk, talking about carbon sequestration, blue carbon, and why the plants do this and why they're important for us to breathe. And, and we talk about why climate change is, you know, how climate change is changing the world. The world, and, and they see the changes in front of their eyes already. And we're trying to talk to them a little bit about the why of that. This is in uh, Mosquito. And now we're talking about the underwater ecosystems. Now, the mangroves don't just have this above ground stuff. They don't just sequester carbon. They also support these fisheries. Every commercially important uh, marine species in the Caribbean spends one or more phases of its life in the seagrass meadows and or mangroves. So without mangroves and without seagrass, no seafood. And also the seagrass are another important part of the blue economy because they, they sequester a lot of carbon and both of these systems together support these international value chains from high value marine products that extend from these villages to uh, markets in North America, Europe and Asia. And this bring millions and millions of dollars into these countries every year and they support the local economy with thousands of dollars every year. And that's very important. So this is a reason why we want to protect this aspect of the blue economy. It's why we don't want to keep mowing down the mangroves because without the mangroves, no seafood. Another aspect of why mangroves are important, why this blue economy is important, is we all have seen these storms getting wetter and worse and windier, causing a lot more problems. Well, mangroves protect the, the uh, coastal plains from these storm surges. The, 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 the storm surges can't go as far inland and they don't have as big an impact. And they're not beating, they're beating on the mangroves. The mangroves are like, it's like tickling them instead of eroding the shore. So this is another reason why it's important. These are things that, you know, over the last couple of years, these horrific storms, they've been seeing this more and more and realizing the why of that. This is in, uh, this one is in Garifuna. This is back in Creole again, and just so you'll know, We've ethno translated this. Every every indigenous language in Belize has has access to a science book in their mother tongue, and we've got every coastal community of the Western Caribbean, from Tabasco all the way to Puerto Limon, Costa Rica. Every linguistic group in there, coastal seafaring linguistic group, has access to a science book from our free digital library, and you can go online and find that from us as well. And this is. Um, some exercises, I didn't want to put the review on there because there's just a bunch of questions. But this is in Creole and English and all. Uh, we teach the students that are close to the sea how to grow a mangrove. And this is a, a lesson they can learn and will continue to grow as they grow. And if your school's not close to the sea, we teach you how to grow a native tree, which is important to you. Um, no no uh, science book is complete without a uh, glossary, and this is no different. This is how you say blue carbon in Maya Yucateco, George Carbono, and uh, the same thing for climate change down there. And these are are, are not neologues, it's new words. These are, are new terms, but climate change is new to us a couple of decades ago, as well as blue carbon, but we still both had those words and all that's what we're doing here. And neologisms are a last resort for this project. Um, my friend Laura took some of these books down to Honduras in um, Mosquito and Garifuna before I did, about four months before I did, just timing thing. And this is the text she sent me back. It says, your biology curriculum uses genre based pedagogy to teach language and culture, each sentence is a gold mine of grammatical and cultural information. And I, and up to this point, I'd only been talking about the materials of the science book, but I'd not designed these materials to do more than that. And this is one of those things I designed. It was really nice to, to hear that come back at me like that. Uh, John Davenport of the uh, Belize Ministry of Education said, you know, we, we I could even use this for uh, to teach social studies. You know, nobody says this kind of stuff about a science book. And I defy any of you to show me that it's not a science book at all because it, it is. But it's got multiple secondary and tertiary benefits from these kind of materials. 
I said Greater Caribbean Basin and beyond. Here's some of that Greater Caribbean Basin. This is our first book in the Francophone. It's in uh, a Haitian Creole for uh, Haiti. This other book is in Burmese for Myanmar. We're also working on materials for uh, in uh, Masima Island, or in Masima for Papua New Guinea, in Bahasa for Indonesia, and some books for uh, East Africa as well. And all these, it's the same mangrove book. It's the same book, it works everywhere. The only thing we do is we change a couple of images to give it greater local context, but we keep the international images in there. So that we can see this is a, not just a global problem, but a regional problem as well and local. And, and so that's a very important thing, aspect of it. Now, these materials must are written for um, first and second form, middle school, secondary school. I, I don't know what you call it where you are, but those are some of the things I'm familiar with calling it. And all, and these are our uh, standard four materials, primary school materials, elementary school materials, whatever you call it, little kids about 10 years old. And that's what this is for. This is my Yucateco. We're talking about manatees here. And the name of our project is Marine Conservation Without Borders. And uh, if our work stopped at the beach, we'd be called Marine Conservation with Borders, but it doesn't. We're uh, now we're working on materials in, uh, on uh, for the scarlet macaw, howler monkey, and other uh, terrestrial and uh, species for inlands. So that way we can invite inland communities to join the project because everybody should have a science book in their first language, right? Yeah. And, uh, and these books that here, they won't work in Myanmar, but uh, the scarlet macaw book will work with any indigenous group living within the range, the native range of the Arab macaw. And the same thing for genus Alawata, it'll work for every, everybody living in the, the range of genus Alawata. Now, what we've been doing lately, you know, and if everything goes right for these materials, Catherine, Alario, and I will be testing these in schools in my communities in Quintana Roo early next year, if, if funding and COVID allow. And uh, we're pretty excited about that. We're about to level up again. Now, let's get to the Sargassum. I'm, part of, I'm one of the hosts for the Sargassum podcast. You see me, Francesca, whose idea this was, and Mara, and we're interviewing uh, a young lady here. And we're talking about um, satellite tracking of these mats that are breaking off and causing these uh, in beaching in inundation events. And uh, we've talked to a lot of really neat people. We've talked to people who are making organic fertilizer, which could be an export commodity in the, from the Yucatan. We have people making paper that could have other purposes too. We've talked to people making soap. There's a Maya community in Quintana Roo that's making soap out of this. A nice, really good looking soap too for the expensive hotels on the, Rio, uh, the Maya Riviera. And so there's a lot of small entrepreneurs doing a lot of stuff. And we want this to be a place where we can have a, a clearinghouse, if you will, of information. Additionally, we, uh, we talk about some pretty technical things too, uh, and, you know, uh, building farms in the middle of the Atlantic to, to grow sargassum, to you know, sequester the CO2 and do a lot of other things with it as we grow it, sink it, feedstock, biofuels and you, you really should check us out we, we, we're, we're talking about to a lot of interesting people of all walks of life indigenous peoples all the way up to scientists and all that, that specialize in sargassum and some of this other really cool stuff however uh our materials would not be complete if we were not creating some materials uh a chapter on sargassum we're working on this sargassum with dr debbie bartlett from the uk and uh and we're creating these materials to go with our books. And I would hopefully that'll be a part of our curriculum in uh, next year in Quintana Roo. Uh, we're starting off talking about, you know, the importance of the Sargasso Sea and why it's an important ecosystem, how it's tied to inland communities. There's animals that live in the rivers right here that go to the Sargasso Sea to reproduce. They do the opposite of what salmon do. And we'll talk about how important that is and then we're going to be talking about some of these other things, the beach inundation events. When I think when Debbie gets it back, gets it back to us, friends, this guy going to some of these other things, these how tos, and talk about some of these small scale entrepreneurs. So we can get, you know, maybe somebody say, you know, I can do that too. I can do that on my island. I can do that in my country. And uh, maybe we get something better started. And I think for this one, when we get it built out, we want to try and get some funded 
on it to really get it out quicker. And because uh, I, hopefully we'll be able to find funding to get it out before the next sargassum season and all. And uh, so that's what we're doing after in post sargassum world. <laughs> anyway, thank you much for your time. I, uh, I appreciate you. Give me your time today. It's all, I know it's all precious and you could have been anywhere else, but you're right here with me and we thank you. Thank you very much.